So are we actually recording now, Jason? Is this it? Okay, so we're on. All right, well, thank you so much for coming. It's marvelous to see you here. So this is the session on UX case love and hate in the issue queue issue garden. Um, actually, the first thing I want to do is change the title. So uh, because having done the work of thinking about this stuff and uh, you know going through what is it we're trying to say exactly, um, the garden didn't seem quite big enough. So we kind of expanded and came up with this new title, Living and Working in Issue Q City. And it just lends itself to more metaphors, which I want to fully exploit and have fun with as we go through it. So first thing is introduction to me and Thomas. Thomas, he didn't make it. Okay, well, I'm fooling with you, you know that. Thomas lives in Sweden, he couldn't make it, it's too far away. So, I'm going to introduce him anyway. He sends his love. Sorry I can't be there in, in person, but I'm there in spirit. He certainly is. He's also here in mind, because I've got his thoughts and some of his uh, words in video recording here in the PowerPoint. So, we've done our best to get him here in a virtual way. Uh, so Thomas is a site builder, uh, passionate about open source, especially Drupal, and uh, he's also an experienced architect. He's got a lot of skill, a lot of talent when it comes to usability issues and so on, and we have some very good uh, conversations together, and this is one of the, uh, the kinds of projects that we do. Um, so his words that he wants to share with you are, it's the whole user experience that matters, not isolated features or details, which makes sense. It's really, it, we can't, we don't want to get lost in little things. We want to think about what is the entire experience about. Now, this isn't, this isn't a session about UX entirely. We used to be in the UX track when we first proposed this, but uh, in thinking about it more and thinking about, you know, you know, what could be done with this, we decided it would be better in this track because we actually want to talk about the community UX. So that's kind of like fusing the two things together. So that's what we're saying. It's the commu community. So to rephrase what Thomas just said, it's the community UX that matters. Uh, my Michael Kira, uh, also known as User Advocate on Twitter and User Space Advocate on Drupal. Um, I'm a UX strategist and a developer. I've been working with uh, usability, user interface stuff, uh, and developing uh, for over 20 years. I used to do things uh, in the graphics area. I used to design and build graphics um, applications. Uh, I've done uh, UX design for call center management systems, for real-time network uh, monitoring systems, um, lots of different things. And I've been sort of taking this slow arc around to web, around to Drupal, and sort of try to bring all those kinds of things into this kind of context, into this field. So that's what I'm trying to bring <coughs> into the Drupal context. So my phrase for the day is, I learn quickly, eventually. And what I mean by that is that I like to postpone that sense of believing that I know something, postpone it for as long as possible, because that extra space allows me to ask more questions, collect more information, get more facts about things, and not jump to conclusions, and most of all, avoid assumptions, because that kills problem solving. So, if this, uh, to use an urban transport metaphor in the issue queue city, if that streetcar was the issue queue, I would be the guy on the bike. I'm not really in the issue queue. I don't really do much there. So, you might ask, why the heck am I speaking about it today? And it's because I think it's still valuable to have an outside-in perspective, especially looking at it in terms of user experience because everybody starts on the outside. So I cherish my issue queue virginity, as it were. And when I run into things that I see in the issue queue that I don't understand, that to me is valuable information, so I want to use that. But in the meantime, uh, of course, we've got Thomas who is on the inside, so the fact that we can collaborate means that we get the best of both worlds, I think. So outside-in perspective is valuable, I think. Now. These streetcars, they tend to run in tracks, and tracks to me are really um, a great metaphor for uh, assumptions, because they guide you, they sort of take you someplace, and it's hard to get out of them. 
So when you're riding a bicycle inside a streetcar, you have to be very careful. You don't get caught inside those tracks and go flying. Same way when I'm doing analysis of a situation, I don't want to get caught in someone's assumptions and uh, end up going down a path that isn't going to lead to a solution. I have to stay outside to get to a solution. So I need to avoid those assumptions. So what I do to avoid assumptions is just simply ask lots of questions, and I reserve the right to ask stupid questions, because those are the ones that really dig up assumptions. And sometimes I drive Thomas mad with my stupid questions. And if you follow the tracks, you end up where they go, and not necessarily to a place that you want to be. So uh, staying on the outside allows me to think outside the tracks and think of where we can go in terms of solutions. So that's just my technique that I'm sharing with you. Okay. Now this is me trying to get UX strategy into the issue queue. I haven't found a way yet. The, the moment of insight hasn't happened yet. I was speaking to Gabor about this, remember at lunchtime. Is there a place for this kind of conversation? Gabor hasn't seen it either, so I think that's a problem. I think we need something. Uh, like that in the community, um, and I'll tell you, uh, I'll speak more about that later. I'm going to get a drink. So there's Thomas on the inside, digging away. And he's been around uh, inside the in issue queue for a while, uh, you know, making comments, uh, digging around and, and planting seeds of conversations, blossoming ideas, and I've been listening to him a lot lately talking about these things, talking about his experiences doing that. So I'm kind of, again, on the outside, guy with a clipboard, observing Thomas, writing things down. And <clears throat> most of that, because he speaks so articulately about these, these things, I don't have to do a lot of work. I can just simply record it and present it here for you, so that's what I'm going to do. But I also have my own ideas about the issue and about you know, the Drupal you know, sort of project as well, which I'll also chip in as a UX strategist. So why the... Why review the issue queue? That's the first fundamental question. It's worth asking. And I'm going to let Thomas answer that first. The issue queue is what drives the Drupal community forward. And the whole Drupal project forward is where the magic happens. I like that word magic for some reason. I think it is magic. I think what we do in the community is magic, and it's astounding. Um, so another way to, that I would put it, is that it is where things happen. It is about where the brain of Drupal is. So I see it as the IQ. The issue queue is the IQ. So I want to boost the Drupal IQ. That's why we're having this 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 presentation here and this starting this discussion. So what we want to do is basically hold up a mirror to the community and say, uh, we want to draw your attention to these things. That's what we're doing in this presentation. However, it's a moving target. And just 12 days ago, this was announced by the Drupal Association. And it is a post about massive changes to the issue page in the issue queue. Um, so first we thought that was going to be a problem, that, oh my god, we've done all this research and we've done all, all these ideas and now it's all blown away. I almost canceled my plane ticket. <laughs> but we looked at it, Thomas looked at it, you know, uh, quite a bit and said, no, what we're saying here is still going to stand. So we'll, we'll ride with that. Just going into the past a little bit, two years ago plus, there was an initiative about the uh, redesigning the issue queue, trying to make it better, led by um, Lisa Michael from the UK, um, who you probably all remember. And um, I, I wanted to acknowledge that because there were some really good ideas brought up there. And this core conversation that she had in Chicago, she, this is one of the slides from there, and she's uh, highlighting the, uh, the values of the community. That second point, be respectful, to me is uh, a particularly useful uh, or uh, meaningful uh, dimension of these values. And I want to bring that up again throughout here. The question is, yes, of course we want to respect each other, the question I want to pose is, are we actually respecting ourselves enough? And I'll explain what I mean by that later. So Prairie Initiative dug up lots of good ideas about how to make things better in the issue queue. That's great. I won't go into all of them. Um, summarize like that. The last one is the one that strikes me as most interesting, where they're talking about we should behave online 
in the same way that we do here at DrupalCon in, in this kind of natural fashion. That, to me, suggests an image like this. If there was a garden, it might look like this, where people are interacting naturally in real time, clear speech, uh, and it's sunny. To me, that's a very nice image. Wouldn't it be nice if the ICQ felt like that? In fact, this is what we're dealing with. This is what it really is. This is like the matrix, right? It's like when you see the code instead of see the illusion. Um, <coughs> so the real question is, when you come to this place, what is your experience? What's it like for you? And I think that probably will fall into uh, two extremes. Anyway, maybe bits in the middle, but two extremes are if you're really experienced in the issue queue and you really know your way around it, I think it probably looks like this. So it's difficult for the outsider like me, but you know, some people are probably in there having a lot of fun and being very capable of doing difficult things. And for someone like me who's inexperienced, I would say it looks more like this. Yeah, that's my experience. How many people here spend a lot of time in the issue queue? How many have tried and not stuck around long? So, so we've got two kinds of experiences there. Um, Okay, for any user in the issue queue, uh, there is that question. I was talking about respect. What does that mean, really, if we respect ourselves? The question is, to what degree is our time being used well? So Thomas has a thing to say about that, and he relates it to, you know, the actual cost in, in dollars. But how much time aren't people wasting in there? I mean, I, I would say with the amount of work being done in the issue queue, we, we know, we're not talking small number of dollars here. We're, not, we're talking probably thousands. It's not tens of thousands of hours every year. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt Thomas like that. I was simply trying to make him louder. I forgot that it stops when you do that. Uh, okay, so he's talking about the fact that um, it probably is costing money. If people are having a bad experience, it means people are not being as productive as they could be. It means they're basically wasting time, and therefore it's costing money. So just make that observation. So not everything is bad news. Uh, Thomas also has a list of favorite improvements that have taken place over the past few years. And let's just quickly go through that list. At the top of the list, there's the follow button. So, before the follow button, and I have a vague memory of, doing, of seeing this, before the follow button, if you wanted to keep in touch with a particular issue that was being discussed, the only way you could do it was to actually enter a comment. It didn't mean you necessarily had something to say, but you had to enter a comment. That was the ticket for admission. So, what evolved as a practice was people would enter a comment that simply said, subscribe, subscribing. And then what would happen is that we'd kick out an email to everybody, say, so-and-so is subscribing, right? And then that happens like... Imagine you know how many emails you got every day of, of those issues with the only content was subscribe. I mean, some, I'm sure that some people like Chicks and, and Gabor and others, they probably got something like 100, 200 emails a day on issues only containing the word subscribe. Is it true, Gabor? Did that happen? Yeah, okay. So, <coughs> it's astounding. But anyway, uh, Lisa raised this uh, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, saying we really should do something about this. And I think that discussion in the Prairie Initiative did lead to the birth of the follow button, where if you want to stay in touch and be on the mailing list, all you have to do is press it. You didn't have to spam in anybody. So, great improvement. Um, edit summary. For me, it's hard to understand and to imagine a time when that edit button didn't exist because it seems so natural. Well, why wouldn't it exist? Well, it didn't exist. So if you wanted to change the description in your summary, you had to enter a comment. Seems very complicated. So welcome improvement, I'm sure, for many people. The semi-WYSIWYG. So again, 
uh, if you wanted things to be more presentable in your comment or in the summary itself, uh, uh, you had to basically write the markup uh, by hand, uh, and which would be a pain if you had bullet points, for example. Um, there's something about bullet points. When you mark those up, it just feels really like a pain. But anyway, pressing a button seems so much easier. Uh, image embed. I remember seeing this, and I couldn't understand it. I was really baffled by this, reading through these uh, conversations, and then someone describing something, mock up they've done, whatever, and there's a leak. And then you go to that, and you go pogo sticking to another page. It's like, that's a funny way to do it. Why would you do it that way? I didn't realize it wasn't because no one actually had fixed the problem. It wasn't by design. It just wasn't there yet. So it is there now. And you can simply drop the picture in the context of the conversation, which seems absolutely obvious, doesn't it? And the test bot, interesting uh, machinery living on Drupal.org that does it in, it installs, uh, uh, I guess, the patch, tests it against certain tests, and then reports on it. Really handy, a little R2-D2 thing. Excellent. So those are the improvements. Um, now, I've got some interesting statistics uh, that Titania, the uh, Drupal Association, provided us with some numbers, and we just done a little examination of comments per month rising steadily for almost 10 years. That's obviously due to a lot of factors, growth, number of projects. Um, but what's interesting about that is it you see it tends to level off at the end there. And it's quite a distinctive change in the pattern. So you have to ask what happened. Well, the follow button happened. <laughs> Which suggests that so much of that you know, that rise in the number of comments per month was actually just simply noise. Interesting. This one I like, this diagram, because it shows uh, the user ID and the number of comments they've made by user. So user number one, whoever that is, is on the left. User one million would come up on the right. And number of comments is on the y-axis. And it's astounding. I mean, when I saw this, I just couldn't believe it because, like, it's tens of thousands. So um, anybody want to guess who the top three are? Come on, guess. What? You know, so coming in at over 35,000, and there's Dries. Um, I, hats off to everybody that shows up on this graph because it just, to me, it's such a vivid illustration of the effort that people put into making this community, making Drupal what it is. I don't actually know who VM is. Gabor, who's VM? Nobody knows, but, but like above 30,000, so interesting. I, I don't know. Um, Thomas, where's Thomas in me? Well, Thomas is coming in at just over a thousand. I'm sweeping the floor. Um, the thousand is an interesting number because if you do a cutoff there, who has commented more than a thousand times, the percentage is less than half a percent. That's amazing. So th you can see how it's skewed completely. Wouldn't it be interesting though if somehow, you know, more people were able to participate? I mean, no, it's just comments. I mean, comments aren't everything. But I think they are a pretty good metric in terms of the ability to community or to participate in the community. Projects per month are going up steadily, steadily, and suddenly <laughs> it leaps. Guess what happened? Any guesses? Good one. Very good. But it goes to this new plateau. So everybody puts the project up all of a sudden, and then it sort of settles in at a higher level. Very interesting. Again, map that against the comments per month. Um, even with that huge spike or increase in the number of projects, the comments still tapered off at the top because presumably the follow button really did have a big effect. It just shows you how one improvement like that can, can change quite a lot. <coughs> so I want to talk about chaos theory because when I see numbers like this of things like throughput, things that are going through a system like this, um, I think it's relevant to look at this this mechanism, which is a clear glass tube with liquid running through it. And this is a kind of a scientific experiment to demonstrate the concept. And the idea is that black line running through the middle is ink. And it's an ink jet that's sort of flowing through as the liquid uh, is going through at a slow rate. It's just a straightforward black line. But as you increase the volume and the rate of you know flow, it changes. So it gets a bit wobbly. And then it gets bumpy. 
and then it becomes turbulent. It's like chaos. And that's simply from one dimension of change, just simply throughput, simply traffic. It causes a complete change of the pattern of behavior in the organization of the of the content of that pipe. And that, frankly, is something we should be careful of because we're facing something like that potentially because we have a similar system. The pipe is the issue queue. There's traffic flowing through it at larger amounts. If it gets sort of <coughs> clogged to a certain point, not clogged, but so that it gets baffled to a certain degree, it will become completely chaotic and completely break down. That's something we don't want to happen. Engineers use turbulence. They use this principle to uh, design systems like heating systems for dissipating energy. So they actually introduce turbulence just so that energy transfer can take place and into the environment. <coughs> but we're a volunteer organization. The last thing we want is our energy to be dissipated into the environment. So that's why we need to be careful about that. So we're volunteer. But it is work. And so I think it's useful to think about the issue queue as actually a workplace, a virtual workplace. It's not like people get money for it. It's not like they you know, travel to you know, a particular place. But they sort of do. It is that they do travel to this virtual place. So you know, we're used to these downtown urban scenarios where you go to your office tower and that's where you do your stuff. But we kind of do the same thing, except we go to different project pages. So if you want to uh, have a discussion, have a meeting around something which is of a concern to you, you have to find the meeting place. So you would go to a particular project page, which is like going to a particular building, and then you would end up in a situation like this. You'd go in the lobby, end up in a situation like this. And then you look in on the conversation, and then you study it, and you think, is this the conversation I want to be in? Are they saying things that mean something to me? And maybe they do, and maybe you participate, and maybe you just consume some information and move on. But these are meeting places. These issues are all meeting places, and there is some kind of cost that it takes for every user, every participant, to get to those meeting places. So the question is, how much cost? How much effort does it take to get to the right meeting place to have the right conversation with the right people at the right time. And there is, a, there is an effort involved. So this is one that I actually visited last week, and it was, uh, it was a good conversation. It was talking about exactly what I wanted to know about, but it didn't have the results I wanted, unfortunately. Um, it was ended up being postponed. Or if it isn't the meeting you want, you may start one of your own. And that's the marvelous thing about virtual space. You can just carve off another room and, uh, and start there. But as you do that, as you carve off more rooms, of course, I'm going to switch metaphors now. Um, the population, the traffic grows. And then it becomes more difficult because you're sort of introducing more noise factor just by setting up a new conversation. And that's, that's potentially a big problem. So as a UX strategist, when I see traffic jams, I look for causes. What is it? What are the obstacles on the road? And there's two that we want to talk about here. There is ambiguity and guesswork. Those are the things that uh, Thomas are, uh, is, is describing that we'll go into. And then there's a lack of UX strategy. Like I said, there's no place to put that stuff. And I'll go into that afterwards. Let's talk about guesswork. I have a game for you. The problem with guesswork is it's not very efficient communication. I'm going to prove it to you. Okay, I've got three characters in mind. I want you to picture them in your own mind and see if you, how close you get to what I'm thinking about, okay? So I've got Mary in a house coat, Lucy in a baby carriage, and a man holding knives. And anybody from Drupal Camp 2008 that saw this already, don't say anything. <laughs> okay, so Mary in a house coat. Picture Mary in your head, what she looked like, okay? This is what I'm thinking. Did anybody guess Mary is a painting on a wall? No hands. Okay. All right, another chance. Lucy in a baby carriage. Picture Lucy in your mind's eye. Did anybody guess Lucy's a dog? Did you? Were you there in 2008? 
<laughs> it's good. You, yeah, you see more. I don't know, maybe the Toronto thing, but you see more and more dogs in baby carriage carriages these days. I don't know why. Okay, good. We got one. Okay, a man holding knives. Picture that. Did anybody picture a small figurine in a kitchen shop with knives stuck through it? He's a knife holder. I would never have that in my kitchen. Okay, uh, so thinking about guesswork, we know how inefficient it is. Uh, it introduces noise, introduces energy dissipation. Uh, where does it happen in the issue queue? Let's look at Thomas's list. Where are we losing energy? Let's look at the workflows. I changed, it's not workflows, it's workarounds. Let's look at the workarounds. Duplicate issues. Of course, if you can't find the conversation that you're looking for, it's very easy to start a new one. So therefore, it's very easy to start to start duplicate issues. Thank you, Gapoor. You're marvelous. Um, and how's that done? Well, it's done simply by uh, labeling something or, or setting the status to closed and marking it as a duplicate. Um, so in this case, we have a lot of conversation taking place. It goes quite a ways down. All of a sudden, Greggles comes along, and he marks it as a duplicate, and he uh, puts the ID of the other uh, node where the, the original conversation is, where the conversation should be happening. So of course, it's going to stop here. It should go to the other place. If we go to the other place, there isn't a backwards reference to that duplicate. So it's just one way. Where are we losing energy? Well, it's status only. There's no linkage, no actual linkage between the two issues. Um, manual markup, so that's going to take time. It's not obvious what's going on, especially to new people, and it's certainly open to interpretation. What does it mean to say something's a duplicate? What's that mean? Get down to it. <coughs> and here's an interesting fact. Right now, today, 15% of core issues are marked as duplicates, and that doesn't include the, the ones that are still open. So that's one in seven. So that's how high the noise rate is. Next problem that needs to be solved is there's no way of showing dependent dependencies between issues. So the workaround is to use the postponed status and to mark something as postponed and sort of write almost anecdotally uh, the little story. Again, Gregor's. I don't know why Gregor's came up twice. Uh, postpone this because it's dependent on that. Um, so what's the problem? Again, there's no structure to this, no structural logic. It means the user has to manually keep track of this. So supposing you have this situation, you're working on uh, you know, project uh, or issue X, Y, Z, and it's dependent on you know, one, two, three. The only way you're going to know that one, two, three is ready for you is you keep checking. So how much time does that take? And then do the numbers. How many people have to do that? So, energy loss. Uh, it can't show parent-child relationships. So the use of um, follow-up has been invented um, to indicate that something is kind of a child issue coming spawning from another uh, parent issue. Uh, again, it's done uh, manually in the comment or in the issue uh, summary. So it's, it's just sort of storytelling, really. There's nothing structural. And this one's interesting. An inadequate tool set for people using it, for regular users. Now we've got a little video here to show you. So uh, the use of Dreaditor is the workaround. I never heard of Dreaditor until Thomas told me about this a few weeks ago. But here's a little demo. Okay, so normally, what you can do, you can use these pads by doing like that. And you just get the, the pads like that. But with Redditor, you click on it, voila! You have it color coded, uh, you see what files it is affecting, and uh, if you want to make a comment uh, about uh, something, you can uh, just highlight the line like that, write. Um, uh, I don't agree, or needs to be fixed, or whatever, a comment about exactly that. You click on save, and then you click on paste, and now you see here, uh, it 
automatically pastes in that part a function I selected with my comment. So, I know it's a bit of a longer video there, but it's such interesting, cool technology. It's such a great idea. Um, but what's the problem? Um, the problem is that not everybody knows about it. It requires installation. It's like a separate thing. So it's not really a bad idea. It's a great idea. It's just not in the issue queue proper. So it takes a little bit extra energy to get there. And then the last one is can't show um, the status of uh, several issues involved with a milestone. So in other words, you can't really group them in an organized way. So the workaround is meta issue. <laughs> At one time I did comment on something. Um, someone pointed out that it was a meta issue. And you know, my was just speaking a completely foreign language, like, and? <laughs> so should I not have commented that? I don't know. Um, I still don't really fully understand it, but I guess not. I don't think about it. So if it's that's the grouping mechanism, then maybe that's not where, not where the conversation should happen, or should it? I don't know. Um, so up at the top, there's the labeling. It's just tacking onto the title at the beginning. And then there's the group of things that it's referring to. But the problem is that after a while, it disappears um, because it doesn't get updated very much. So it kind of falls off the bottom. No one's ever heard of it again. Um, there's no structural connections to define those things. So if you're down in one of those sub-issues, you wouldn't know about the peers. You wouldn't know about the parent. So what is the meaning of that group? Um, so not perfect. And I like this. Um, really, you know, Karen's going to talk about this tomorrow. I hope I don't scoop it too much. It's 10 people finding out what she's going to do the day before. Okay. Um, we're in a war of blobs versus chunks. I love this quote. You're all on Team Chunk. We cannot let the blobs win. So what she's referring to is lack of structure. So everything she's going to talk about tomorrow, about content, how to really do content for the future, I think applies here as well. We've got too many blobs happening in the issue queue, not enough structure. So, a couple more uh, external workarounds. Um, and it kind of shows you the almost desperation that people must be in just to get through this task of, say, building D8, where an entirely separate site has been created so just to get some sense of management of the issues that matter to, to them. And this is, you know, core. So this, this whole core mentoring website that was put together which has some extra sort of love and care around these particular topics and so on in such a way that it's easier for that direct sort of team of people to just simply get a grasp on the issues that are important and, and just work with them. And ultimately, they will lead to the issue queue proper. <coughs> but then the other one, Gabor's, uh, for the multilingual initiative, it's a nice website. It's got lots of great things. It's got news. It's got training videos. And it's got these focus issues and so on. And again, it ultimately leads you back to the issue queue. So the only problem with this is that, you know, they, you know, well, yeah, it does take some extra effort to find. Um, there is a bit of fragmentation because it's now in multiple places. But, it, you know, all those improvements that they made on those separate sites are isolated there. They're not actually in the issue queue. So that's, that's a bit of a loss, really. So how can we conserve the energy, Thomas? That for you to make any sense and use of the issue queue, you have, you have a long list of things you need to learn, exactly how they work. Because you stumble on them all the time if you spend, spend time in the issue queues. There's nothing that logic about it, and, and there, are very, there, there are as many variants of, of those workarounds as there are people trying to use them and, and apply them. Because people do things differently when they have a choice. So what he's talking about is, you know, the the, the, the blobbiness, you know, the vagueness, the ambiguity, the guesswork that's involved um, when we don't have the structure, right? So the solution would be. But if, if you have a feature that says, okay, this is a duplicate of this issue, and and you select duplicate, and it pops up. Uh, little box where you, you type in the issue queue no, issue number of that other issue, that's only one way of doing it. And everyone's going to be happy. 
because everyone gonna know exactly how that works, and it's handled automatically in the back end. Job done. So the idea is that actually it's sort of reintroducing the concept of guidance and, if you will, rails to make the path go where you want it to go, right? So it's kind of the opposite to what I was saying, but now that we know where we want to go, we, and what I mean, how do we know that? Because the workarounds exist. We know the, the kind of usage patterns that the community wants because these workarounds exist. It's called cow paths, when people go off the paved path because they want to go to take the shortcut it ends up becoming a trail like that. That's what we're looking at, those workarounds. And then ultimately, the rallying cry for UX design is pave the cow paths, because that's, that's where people really do go. So that's the recommendation, that that kind of uh, activity, the intelligence that the community has already established there through the invention of these workarounds needs to be embraced, needs to be formalized. Okay, so... I'm going to take a break. Okay, nobody wants their time wasted. I just have to demo that bit. You don't want me to waste your time. So um, that's the respect thing again. So to what extent are we respecting ourselves, respecting each other, when we work with these kind of work around these kind of solutions instead of really having the solution that we need? That's the question. Then. So again, Thomas uh, raises that. How much time are we wasting? And he points it to the fact that UX strategy, the bit that I can't find anywhere on Drupal Dollar, is simply not taken seriously enough. So let's look at that. What is UX strategy? So the real, the nature of the problem around the issue as far as I'm concerned is one of mass transit. It's a mass transit problem. How do we get people en masse to the meetings they're trying to get to efficiently and quickly? So. That's what the UX strategy should try to accomplish. So if this is Drupal.org, then this is us. We're the intelligence. And we all have reasons for being there, individually and collectively. And really, if we have reasons for being there, we have some intent. So the question is, what is that intent? What is the business intent? Now, what I mean by business is not about strictly money-making, it's not about increasing the rate of profit, it's about what is it of value that you want to bring to the world? What is your stock and trade? And you may be a non-profit organization, you still have a business to help your clientele. Or you may be uh, in the education field, and you still have a business to disseminate information, right? And so there is a business intent to Drupal.org, to the larger community. And there's a business intent to everybody involved as well. So on the home page, that's one uh, particular intent. On a project page, there would be another one as well. And on the issue queue page, and on the issue page itself, that was just radically changed by the Drupal organization. So all of these, this is like four sample pages underneath Drupal.org, and they all have different intents. For example, provide information, provide function, provide feedback, provide labor. They're quite different things, yet it's all on one side. So the business intent of the whole thing is actually a cluster of things that all work together. So that's why I say a page, a web page, is a unit of business intent. And we don't have to think about it. There's more discussion now happening around that. What is a web page like Krell's uh, core conversation? Is it a CMS or is a word publishing tool? Uh, sorry, a web publishing tool. And I think it's useful to not think about it in terms of web publishing. Don't think about it in terms of making something that looks like things that used to be printed. It's really what was your intent behind having it. And that's where we can incorporate the newer emphasis on structured content.
because that content and the rules around that content can be structured around the intent itself. What should be there? The only way you can answer that is, well, what's the purpose of that page? You can still have the concept of page. It's just not anything like a printed page anymore, but it's exactly what all that stuff was about in the first place, which is I'm trying to accomplish this yep, at this location. That all still holds together. If you flip it around, look at it from the user's point of view, users bring different mindsets to these locations. So the language changes slightly. So someone coming to the top to Drupal.org is maybe looking for information. Someone coming to a module page is looking for functionality. Someone that's coming to the issue queue page has feedback to offer. And someone coming to an issue page proper has uh, the ability to help out and pitch in, submit a patch, etc. So these are task objectives. So when you put this together, the whole point behind UX strategy is that you marry the business intent with users' task objectives. That's all UX strategy is. That's all we need to do. So when I approach these problems of user interface design, UX design, I always ask these questions. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I forgot this slide. People come at it through different entrances, and you have to have those entrances built to suit their needs, built to suit their, their objectives and their character. So in that case, we've got, uh, it's actually a children's toy store in Madrid. Uh, it's just always so cute. So you've got an adult entrance and you've got this shorter child entrance. It's very cute. So I always ask these questions. Who is the user? What are their task objectives? And how much do those uh, task objectives, or how do those task objectives match our business intent? And where can we get those matches to take place? That's an entire exercise out there of UX problem solving. So let's look at some more numbers. And again, it's about the time that we're potentially wasting, the time that we are wasting, the time that we can potentially save, and how much time people do have to spend on Drupal. It's a limited time. It means larger volunteers have got to be limited. It's not going to go forever. There's almost a million people uh, with accounts on Drupal.org right now. If we saved a million people, or this many people, uh, 10 minutes, even across a year, that's pretty modest. Look at how it adds up. It adds up to 18 years, 24 hours a day, seven days a week of time that could be used for productive activity as opposed to just trying to get to the meeting space, the meeting place where they're going to have that conversation. Right? So that's a pretty compelling number as far as I'm concerned. Now, Here's where the follow button was announced. But look at what it says. Six years. It took six years after the idea was thought of for the follow button to actually take to take form. How much time was lost in that six years, if you look at those numbers? And why? That, to me, is not us respecting ourselves. That is us completely dis disrespecting our time. Say it's, uh, let's say it's 25,000 hours a year, and take that times $100 an hour. That's two and a half million dollars right there. So <laughs> where are we going to find the money? Well, if you do the math, there's got to be money out there somehow. How do you actually turn that concept that there's potentially you know, millions of dollars of people's time being thrown away into something which can actually take shape and take form and actually get these workarounds formalized, get those cow paths paved, and get people more productive. So what I'm thinking is we know that the figures are there, the numbers are there. We know that the, the risk is real, that this could actually you know, continue to increase and then fundamentally it could break down because it's just unusable on the issue queue. So we have a choice. Do we want to reduce the time and effort that it takes to have meaningful meetings in the issue queue? Yes or no? Do we want to spend the limited time that we have on more productive things as opposed to commuting, so to speak, to these meeting places? Do we want to achieve the, the objectives that were identified by the Prairie Initiative over two years ago? The last comment I saw on that initiative, by the way, was March 2011. It basically stopped. Do we want to do that? Well, maybe it's just an idea. Maybe we can send ourselves a message. So if you agree that maybe if the 
Drupal Association can fix the issue page itself if it's their job and I'm just maybe uh, uh, guessing this is, this is uh, how we can solve it, but if they can do that, maybe they can also help out and actually uh, allocate some resources to getting these countdowns paid. So, I'm just going to say, tweet it out. <laughs> spread it around. Try and get the idea spread. Let's see if we can start a dialogue with the Drupal Association. Maybe they don't have the money right now, but maybe if enough people say, please, this is a solvable problem, can we do it? Can we somehow use our own organization, our decision-making body, to focus some energy on this and save our time? And if we can do that, I mean, we are already an astounding organization, astounding community, but maybe we can do even more astounding things. Thank you. It's been a wonderful day. I'm so glad you came. So, any questions? I certainly got time now. I can try. Is this right or is this wrong? They might disagree. sense to me. Like I said, I'm an issue Q newbie, right? But, and, and Gabor and, and Rob Roach at lunch were saying, well, why? Why do I not participate in the issue Q? And frankly, a lot of it is fear. Because I don't know what I'm doing. I don't want to waste people's time by saying the wrong thing at the wrong time, the wrong place. Right? And I don't understand the implications of, you know, any efforts that I might have. And I don't know where to put the UX strategy discussion. And I don't have time to read all the comments just to find out, well, where are we at now? Right? So, another thing, and I didn't put this in here, but another idea which may or may not have some value um, is if you look at, say, the tagging that takes place, if you're looking, you know, tags are ways of sorting and finding things, right? But if you look at how the tagging takes place, you look up UX, and, you know, it's got a whole bunch of suggestions, you know, with UX in it. And it's absolutely impossible to make a decision there even, right? There's, it's another blob. Which tag would I use? So again, it's energy lost. My thinking is that if we didn't just have it completely free like that, if we actually put something in, intentional, there's intent again, in at some top level, so it's an easy decision, and then you let the community intelligence kick in and say, oh, well, that's clearly UX, and that's all you have to decide just one tag for that level, or that's, you know, core, or whatever, right? And then I think if you build the right taxonomy and the right structure, things will simply filter down to the right place, just like coins in one of those coin sorting machines, right? All the dimes and the pennies and the nickel are going to show up in the right columns. But that's a different approach. It's not free tagging. It's a very structured taxonomy. But just on a gut instinct, I think that could be very beneficial. The worst thing you can have if you go a tagging system is, is basically tag pollution. Tag, tag, a, tag, a taxonomy is like a well, you know, that you drink from. And if it's dirty, <laughs> if it's polluted, it's useless. You can't use it. Anyway, so I'm going to get off this stage, and I'm just going to have normal conversations with people. I really do appreciate you coming. It's been, it's been fun to work on this.